welcome to The Vaccine. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. Australia's medicines regulator has approved a booster shot for all Australians aged over 18, six months after their second dose. It comes as Victorian authorities lift more restrictions, despite the state still recording thousands of new infections and a record death toll for this outbreak. And for the first time in more than 600 days, Australians can soon freely travel overseas. So if other highly vaccinated countries are an indication of what living with COVID looks like, it's certain there are more bumps ahead. Three months after people in the UK celebrated their Freedom Day, the country is dealing with a surge of cases, hospitalisations and deaths. Dr Gabriel Scarley is a professor of public health at the University of Bristol and he's among a group of independent scientists which is critical about the lack of preventative controls in the UK since Freedom Day. Dr Scarley, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Compared to Australia, the UK is several months down the track of its post-Freedom Day emergence from lockdown. Is living with the virus going as expected? Well, it depends on your expectations. I think a lot of people thought, well, and people talked about it in the same sort of way as talking about flu, that we'd all get used to it and so on, and that it would be fine and it would fade away and also all of those predictions. Uh, it hasn't turned out like that, and I think um, the, the, the predictions of those who are much more cautious about this really dangerous virus have come true because we're still seeing very high caseloads. We're still seeing uh, very high levels of admission to hospital and deaths we're seeing across the UK, a death rate of uh, anything up to 800, 900 deaths per week, which for a, a new disease is just remarkable. And that represents maybe in some parts of the country, one in 10 of all deaths that are taking place are, are COVID related deaths. So it, it's still a real problem. You're an advocate for the three pronged approach of prevention, vaccination and control. The scale of restrictions, though, means that it costs public goodwill, livelihoods, mental health. How far can those measures go before you really start to lose people along the way? Yes, uh, that's a very good question and, uh, and a good point. And you're quite right that people will respond. Actually, one of the, I think one of the characteristics of the um, pandemic is that when, when the public have been asked to do things and it's been explained clearly why they need to do them, they've done them with a heart and a half. They understand that. But we've been bedeviled by unclear and inconsistent messaging. And that is what really undermines public trust. People saying to them, uh, you, you, you can do this or you might do this or you might like to do this and it may not work or whatever. That good, clear messages are something that we haven't had. And also we've had dither and delay along the way. For example, I mean, vaccination is a good example. Um, the vaccination for young people, for uh, young people aged uh, 12 and over uh, 12 to 17, um, was approved uh, in last June, and it took months and months and months before the government deployed that vaccination. And even then, they only allowed young people to have one shot of it, whereas the recommended uh, was two. So that sort of delay and then mixed message, mm, you know, it, it, it's good, but maybe not, and you don't need it or whatever. All of that creates a problem. And we've ended up with two thirds of the population vaccinated, the total population. And that is just not good enough to keep the virus under control. It, 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 isn't, for, it isn't for measles or mumps or, or, or rubella. You know, it just, this is such an infectious disease. We need to be up there around 80, 90% to get, to get that sort of benefit. Some leaders around the world, including here in Australia, are pledging that mass lockdowns are a thing of the past. What do you think about that? Is there a reasonable outlook and expectation? I, I think they are a thing of the past. We don't need those high level restrictions if we do the other stuff. Uh, at, at the moment, I think major concern is that we will protect a lot of people and a lot of people uh, will get enough immunity uh, from the vaccination program in particular to make sure that they don't end up in hospital, that they, do, that they don't die, they don't get serious illness. But there are a lot of people still vulnerable, maybe because they haven't been vaccinated yet for whatever reason. And some people can't be vaccinated because they've got allergies for medical reasons. Uh, there are people vulnerable because they're having uh, treatments that result in a, a reduced immune uh, system response. So they're vulnerable to viruses anyway. So there are lots of people vulnerable and we've got to keep them safe. And what we do know also is that the vaccines don't give 
lifelong protection, unfortunately. Uh, the, the protection wanes and people do become susceptible. So for all of those people with underlying conditions that might make things worse, it is a worrying time. So I don't think we're in the realm anymore of mass lockdowns, and that's a, a great thing. I, and we should stop talking like that. And we should start talking about uh, this virus as, you know, a virus like like uh, the other things that we deal with, the infectious diseases we, we deal with. And what we do is we get, we, you, you put the public health system into operation and, and you do the health education and you do the preventive measures and you do the, the finding cases, testing, tracing, uh, isolation, etc. All of those really just fundamental good health measures. And maybe we need our politicians to be uh, you know, giving those public health messages and not talking in hyperbole about, uh, you know, no more lockdowns or uh, freedom days or whatever. Uh, let's get on with getting this virus out of our lives and, and, and out of our towns, out of our cities, out of our families and get it under control. And it, it is not easy. It's taken decades to get measles under control in, in many, many countries and eliminated. And, and, and it, it, the UK has lost its measles in uh, elimination status a few years ago because our public health system went into de decline and decay. So it is a public health issue now. It's, it, it's one that can be left to the public health system. Dr Gabriel Scarley, it's good to have you with us. Thank you. A, pl a real pleasure. Singapore, which has long been seen as a COVID success story with high vaccination rates, is experiencing what government officials are describing as an unusual surge of infections. Associate Professor Lim Polyan is the director of the High Level Isolation Unit at Singapore's National Centre for Infectious Diseases. She joins us now. Professor Lim, thanks so much for joining us. Um, Singapore has a very, very high vaccination rate, 80 plus percent of the whole population. But there is this surge taking place. How concerned are you about that? Well, we are concerned because, you know, it is a surge with thousands of cases. It's probably some of the no highest numbers we've seen since the pandemic started. But in many ways, we did expect that there would be an increase in cases. I mean, it's really due to a combination of factors. Um, the first is the highly infectious Delta strain, which is now almost 100% of all the COVID in Singapore. Um, secondly, um, we know that there is effect, uh, waning of uh, vaccine effectiveness as people are coming almost more than seven months, five, six, seven months out from the initial vaccinations. And then the third reason is because of Singapore's decision that we have to learn to live with COVID. And so we've been cautiously reopening after we achieved 80% vaccination rates. So you mentioned the boosters program. I think something like 14% of Singaporeans have had the booster so far. How important is that in your national arsenal right now? We think it's really important. I'm an ID physician seeing patients. And um, to address waning immunity, um, it's necessary to get the boosters out, particularly for those who are older, older than 60. Um, but we are now uh, recommending boosters for everyone over 30 years of age. The other public health measures that we use, um, including you know, dining out restrictions and uh, other public health measures, working from home, that together as a bundle help to reduce the spread of Delta. Can I bring you to the question of travel? Because a travel bubble is about to open up between our two countries. How are people there feeling about it? And how much of a risk does that pose to, the, uh, to, to both countries? So we know that the pre-departure testing, as well as other border control measures, have really kept imported infections from um, introducing, uh, you know, vac in infections from international travel. And um, we have been piloting the vaccinated travel lanes uh, with Germany and Brunei for the last uh, few weeks. And we know that um, th those measures work. So we're looking forward to these uh, vaccinated travel lanes. Um, with Australia and with lots of other countries, such as the US and Canada and uh, various European countries and uh, with South Korea. So we do think that it, it will um, help control as we reopen cautiously but safely. Professor Lim Polian, so good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So what can we learn from these experiences overseas? Dr Norman Swan is with us now. Uh, Dr Swan, let's pull together the experiences of other countries that are in a similar position to Australia. Does it tell us much about where we are headed? 
Yeah, it tells us a lot. Um, we're headed to a good place in one sense, which is that, well, some states are. So the ACT will probably be the highest immunized population in the world. I think it's going to be hard to find somebody aged over 12 to immunize in the ACT. It's really phenomenal. Um, but Victoria, New South Wales doing well. Tasmania is doing well. Um, but uh, states like Western Australia and Queensland really need to look at those um, results from, say, Singapore, where um, they're you know not far off 90%, and they're getting 5,000 cases a day in a population of four or five million. Denmark, which opened up on the 10th of September and really released all its restrictions, has seen more than a tripling of its cases and a steady creep upwards of its hospitalizations. What we didn't hear from there was Singapore, from Singapore was its hospitalization rate, which is still staying fairly low, but they are worried about they are worried about it as a, as a proportion. Um, and what this means is bottom line, uh, sorry, and, and Britain, it's very hard to compare ourselves to Britain. Britain has stuffed it up from beginning to end, really. Um, and as uh, Dr. Sky was implying, and uh, they are stalled at 67% of the whole population. So they're not highly vaccinated at all. And seeing the, reaping the fruits of that, the bitter fruits of that. Look, bottom line, we can't rely on vaccines alone. We are going to have to lie, rely on other measures. So we're going to have to continue testing. We're going to have to use rapid antigen testing intelligently. We are going to have to continue isolation in a limited way so that we pull people who are infected out. We can't let the virus rip through because there will still be a proportion of people who are unvaccinated and in whom this, their immune system is waning and will may wane in some people before the six month level, uh, six month barrier or time limit. And so masks, masks indoors in public places, um, testing when you've got symptoms, testing, rapid antigen testing of staff in critical areas like childcare. Um, if you've, we're going to see more and more outbreaks in childcare and in gymnasia and so on. Rapid antigen testing could start identifying staff, for example, who are not infectious, who can go back to work, all sorts of things like that, without having to go back to lockdown. At the same time, we're looking at the booster program rolling out in the next few months. How much of a difference will that make to our risk profile as the borders start to reopen? Well, it's not so much the borders, it's more opening up. By the way, Singapore hasn't opened that much. They might think they have. You can't get more than two people at a table. They're wearing masks outdoors as well as indoors. Singapore has not opened up that much compared to us. So it's opening up that's the risk. So the booster shots are fairly urgent for people in residential aged care, the elderly, say, aged over 80, um, healthcare workers who are immunized back in March and April. They need to be getting their booster program now. Otherwise, we will see a surge um, of hospitalizations, in, particularly in the elderly. So we've got to get onto that, and it's good that it's been approved. And as long as we are ahead of the curve with the booster program and, um, and, and implement it widely, it's, it's probably the wrong thing to say that this is not part of the core immunization program. It probably is part of the core immunization program. Israel has recognized that and that we will all need to get three doses. It's not so much a booster. It's that if we'd had time to study these vaccines properly, we would have probably been introduced as three dose vaccines. And so we all need a third dose like we do with hepatitis B, um, and the, the human papilloma virus, the first three doses in childhood. We need to get used to that idea. And then once we've had a third dose, we're going to be pretty well covered, I think. Uh, rapid antigen tests as quickly uh, hit the supermarkets in the next uh, few days and weeks. That's going to be a really important part of this fight, isn't it? It is, but I'm not quite sure that the supermarket access is the important part. I think the important part is organised testing of high-risk environments, like Meatworks. There's a Meatworks in Melbourne where they're using rapid antigen testing in the middle of an outbreak right now. Um, in introducing rapid antigen testing for people coming in from overseas. They're very good at identifying people who are actively infectious, and we should be more intelligently using that. Yes, we can do it for our own sake to settle our own minds at home, but a single rapid antigen testing is a, a little bit inaccurate. You've got to do it every two or three days to make sure that it's accurate. But it's got that potential to make a big difference. Norman Swan, good to have you with us again. Thank you. My pleasure, Jess. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company. From all of us, bye for now.